Hi, I'm Kara Pike, Director of Climate Access. Welcome to the Communicating Change series, where we will be exploring best practices in climate communication and behavior change. The first topic in our series is close to home, communicating climate impacts. Public debate over global warming has largely focused on whether or not the challenge is real, human caused, and significant enough to warrant a response. Unfortunately, climate impacts are becoming more and more apparent with unprecedented drought, fire, and extreme storm events. It's critical we move into the climate impacts conversation in a way that helps the public understand the risks that we're facing and the solutions that are available to address the challenge without becoming overwhelmed. The topic is also timely because climate modeling is becoming more sophisticated and we're getting a closer look into regional, if not local, climate impacts. The third National Climate Assessment, released earlier this year, takes a close look at the American impacts landscape. Here to speak with us about how to convey climate impacts and solutions is Dr. Ed Maybeck, Director of George Mason University's Center on Climate Change Communication. Hello, Kara. Thanks so much, Ed. And I'd like to kick things off by asking you if you can share with us a bit about what the polling is saying regarding how much the public is connecting the dots between extreme weather events and climate change. Yeah, the polling data, we, we've been tracking this one for a couple of years now, and the, the polling data shows that uh, increasingly the public is beginning to ca connect the dots. Um, we, we found that, uh, that a majority of Americans um, feel that the weather is getting worse in the U.S. in general. Um, about half of, the, uh, half of the adults feel that, uh, American adults feel the weather is getting worse in their area in specific. And uh, a growing majority believe that climate change is affecting the weather in the U.S. So not only are they detecting the change in the weather, but they're starting to attribute it to climate change. Um, and then finally, we've, we've tracked um, sort of significant weather and climatic events as they happen, like the, the El Derecho that affected us here in the Mid-Atlantic region last summer, um, and, uh, and a variety of other major weather and climatic events. And we've shown that a majority of Americans see each of those as being made worse by by climate change. So it, it really seems like the public is beginning to connect the dots on this one. I'm wondering if you could tell us if extreme weather events such as Superstorm Sandy, which we just experienced, can have a lasting impact on awareness. And if people need to directly experience those impacts themselves, or if that awareness can be built outside of the immediate storm regions. What has been shown by climate scientists and, and was pretty nicely reported in the, uh, in the 2009 National Climate Assessment is that the weather is being affected. More, there's more extreme weather in every region of America now. Um, and, uh, and what my colleague Karen Akerloff showed in some research that she did a couple of summers ago in uh, northern Michigan is that, that people are actually pretty good at um, identifying uh, or sort of paying attention to the ways, even very subtle ways, in which the, the weather is changing or, or the, that the climate is changing local weather. So for example, people who tell us that they've personally experienced climate change, when we ask them why, they tend to report things like um, shifts in the season. So, you know, fall occurring uh, earlier or spring uh, occur occurring earlier um, and so while you know clearly major s events like Superstorm Sandy are going to get a lot of attention that's not the only thing that that people are noticing you know whether or not these things wear off over time so you know whether or not Superstorm Sandy is going to, to loom uh, less large in the public's mind probably yes although there isn't a whole lot of data on that yet uh, I know a couple of other uh, social scientists Chris Boric and Barry Rabe for example um, they're in the field right now doing a survey trying to, to look at, at just this question um, but one thing is fairly certain and, and that is Mother Nature is probably not going to let up on us very much um, the past couple of years have perhaps been um, more there's been more extreme weather than anybody anticipated, um, but one thing is for certain, and that is this is exactly the kind of trend that is expected. Um, so as long as the media covers the issue, and Mother Nature seems to be doing her part, uh, teaching us about climate change. I know some of your research uh, shows that even with people who have concern over climate change, there tends to be very few people who think there is a whole lot we can do about it or that it's a very solvable challenge. So I'm wondering about some of the downsides with heightening impacts. Does it lead at all to uh, an increased sense of fear 
or sense that we're really uh, ill-equipped to address the magnitude of the problem? That's a, another really great question, Kara. Um, I, I actually, I think it's um, understandable why, uh, why, why that might be the case, but I've come to believe just the opposite. Um, I actually, uh, I, I believe based both on our survey data as well as some experimental work we're doing, that when you, um, when you show people local impacts, impacts in their community, um, and when you can put those impacts in perspective, for example, by, um, by showing how this has been a trend that has been developing over the past couple of decades, um, which is pretty to do, pr pretty easily done, especially with regard to extreme weather, because um, in any community in America, uh, you can go back, uh, the, the weather data is there, um, NCDC uh, of NOAA um, has the data that, that's accessible, and, uh, and you can pretty quickly chart the fact that, the, that extreme weather has become um, being uh, has been becoming more extreme and and occurring more frequently, um, but that's not necessarily so. Showing that kind of thing um, is not necessarily a fear appeal. It's not. It doesn't raise people's sense of fear. Um, if anything, uh, it it it, ga it gains their interest because you're talking about things that they care about. You're talking about their community impacts in their community or impacts in places that they are fond of. Majorities of the public accept the issue is real and are concerned, but when it comes to ranking climate change on a list of priorities, it really hasn't budged too much over the last 15 years and tends to be at the bottom of that list. As we move into the impacts conversation and people are gaining more of a sense of how global warming impacts their lives, do you see issue priority shifting at all? You're right. It's not um, climate change isn't rapidly rising on the list of concerns, um, but I think that has something to do with the fact that most Americans tend to th think of climate change as a distant problem, both distant in time and and dif distant in space. Um, so it uh, it's a problem that they see as happening elsewhere, perhaps overseas, maybe sub-Saharan Africa, um, and it's a problem that they see as as manifesting or beginning to manifest sometime in the future, not yet, um, which is precisely why I think it is so important to show Americans, show people anywhere in the world for that matter, but particularly to show Americans how that, that climate change is actually a here and now problem, um, that the impacts of climate change are being felt in every community across America. Um, this isn't a distant problem. It's happening here. It's not a uh, it's not, a, uh, it's not a future problem, it's happening now. Um, and that's a wonderful way to make this a more top of mind kind of concern, or, or at least help correct people's misperception that, that this is a problem distant to them. Um, I think to the extent that place-based education of this type takes place, um, and the extent to which the, the media continues to do a, a good job of educating uh, their viewers or their, their readers about uh, the relationship between extreme weather and climate climate change, um, I, I believe that we will see that, that bias, that misunderstanding of climate change being distant, um, being corrected. And, and what should happen as a result is that climate change should climb that list of priorities. When it comes to communication, we know audience is key. What can you tell us about how different segments of the public respond to climate impacts and learn either through experience or through motivated reasoning? For uh, your listeners who are aware of our, our Global Warming Six Americas work, um, this will make more sense to them, but uh, for those who aren't, I'll just say that we've done some audience segmentation research and shown that there are six distinct groups of Americans in terms of their beliefs and their behaviors and their policy support for dealing with climate change. We call those six groups Global Warming Six Americas. Um, only two of those groups have a, a, a large degree of issue engagement. They are the alarm segment and the dismissive segment. Interestingly enough, they're, they're, while they're both heavily engaged in the issue, they've reached the opposite conclusion. The alarmed feel that climate change is real and they're very concerned about it. The dismissive feel it is not real and they're very concerned that our nation will respond to a, a non-problem. But the other four segments, the other four uh, Global Warming Six America segments who are in the middle of the continuum, that to a greater or lesser degree, they don't have a lot of personal engagement in the issue. 
And what my colleague Teresa Myers found in her research is that the two segments of Americans who are showing motivated reasoning are, the, are members of the alarm segment and the dismissive segment. They feel so certain of their beliefs that they're interpreting um, indicators that they see in, you know, in their community around them as either further proof that climate change is happening um, or just the opposite. The dismissive interpret as, as you know, this is yet another um, non-signal that the alarmists are going to misinterpret. But the really important finding is that the, the four segments in the middle, that's three out of four adult Americans, um, they learned, uh, they uh, essentially learned from personal experience. They, they engaged in experiential learning. Um, so Mother Nature and, and the, whether it was the media teaching them about uh, these climate signals or whether it was an interpreter in their favorite state park or, or possibly even a weathercaster in their community. Um, the combination of Mother Nature doing her teaching and, and interpreters um, in their community helping interpret what that means um, proved to be a really important indicator of or driver of experiential learning. So the good news is that moving into an impacts conversation really does have the potential to resonate with a range of the public and perhaps uh, local leaders, business leaders, community leaders, as well as political leaders are starting to pick up on this, such as New York Governor Andrew Cuomo who commented on the need to prepare for future extreme weather events in the aftermath of Sandy. Should we rebuild? Where and how? Uh, maybe Mother Nature is telling us something. Uh, one time, two times, three times. Uh, there are places that are going to be uh, victimized by storms. We know that now. Well, what is the technology? What is the construction technique to build in those areas? I know in the wake of uh, extreme weather events like Superstorm Sandy, Katrina, other events we've seen of late, uh, there's a tendency to want to get back to normal as possible and that sort of human need to uh, be reconnected to that sense of place. How can communicators recognize the importance of that desire to uh, resolve some of the immediate impacts on human communities while at the same time opening up the conversation to consider some of the longer trends around climate impacts that might have you questioning rebuilding in vulnerable areas. You know, that, that really is a, a um, there's a certain amount of delicacy around that, but uh, at the risk of being indelicate, if, if we are not using these uh, extreme weather events as an opportunity to call the question about um, changing our priorities in terms of the way we zone, in terms of our, our development uh, priorities, um, whether that is uh, right along the coasts, whether that is in floodplains, um, we're, we're really missing an important, uh, a really critical important window of opportunity um, to start that conversation when people are paying attention and when they are most likely to understand the relevance of the question that we are calling. Um, so even if it is a little bit indelicate um, when people are suffering as they are clearly still suffering as a result of Superstorm Sandy, um, the, the voices in the uh, you know in New Jersey in New York who are um, fairly aggressively calling the question pushing this agenda um, openly suggesting that it's time for us to reevaluate the way we have been rebuilding communities um, and the way we have uh, zoned our communities, they're doing exactly the right thing. Um, and I, I, you know, it's too soon to say, but I would, um, it certainly strikes me that the kind of progress they are making right now in, in New York and in New Jersey um, is, is really unprecedented. It's the kind of progress we wouldn't see any other way um, if they hadn't been prepared to use uh, uh, the superstorm as an opportunity to call the question and forcefully assert that it's time for us to reevaluate our operating assumptions. Let me shift quickly. At the outset, I mentioned the third national climate assessment released uh, early 2013 in draft form is out. And uh, Ed, you're co-chair of the engagement and communication working group of the National Climate Assessment Development and Advisory Committee. And I'm wondering if you could share with us what communicators should expect from um, that report and how they can incorporate the new trend data into their communication efforts. 
cognitive scientists uh, have shown that it's really hard for people to imagine scenarios that they've never experienced before. And certainly nobody alive today or anybody alive for a, a very long time um, has experienced the kind of scenario that, that we will be likely experiencing going forward. And so for this kind of exercise, the National Climate Assessment, to try to paint a, a in simple, clear, non-fear-based terms, paint uh, you know, the range of scenarios that we might, that, that we are already experiencing, um, the range of situations that we're already experiencing and the range of scenarios that we might experience is incredibly helpful from a communication perspective. Um, so my hope is that every climate change communicator who, who's listening to this broadcast and, and, and all of the others who are involved with climate access and, and elsewhere around the country um, do take the time to download the, the third assessment. And secondly and finally, I, I hope they take the time to give us feedback. We're, we're releasing this draft as a draft for public comment. We realize it, it, it's not going to be a perfect document. Um, we want your help in perfecting it. Um, the final release will be um, hopefully in January of 2014. Um, there is still time to improve what we are doing. Um, and moreover, there is also, we've put in place a process that we're, called, that we're calling a sustained assessment process. It's not just going to be a quadrennial or every four year assessment going forward. We're, we're going to try to be more responsive in real time, identifying assessment topics that need to be um, focused on now and reports released more, more quickly. Um, and so we're very eager to hear back from stakeholders around America, including America's climate change communication experts, on what those topics should be. What are the, uh, the interim assessment pro products um, that ought to become a priority? And I'd like to move us to close and ask Ed if you could give your top tips for uh, communicators to move into that impacts conversation and tie impacts to solutions. I, I encourage everyone I work with, all of my students, all of the stakeholders that I get a chance to, to work with, to em embrace um, my own personal communication mantra, which is simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted sources. Climate change is not simple. Um, it's often not communicated in a clear way. We often don't repeat the, the most important messages um, with sufficient frequency. Um, and as a result, while Americans do hear a lot about climate change, they tend to hear a lot of um, reasonably, uh, for in their minds, uh, reasonably small disconnected facts which aren't creating a, a coherent whole. So what I, I encourage um, communicators to do, and what particularly what I'm encouraging the climate science community to do is to convey um, what I currently call the big five. Five simple clear ideas which our research shows really make a difference in helping members of the public understand climate change in a, a way more comparable to that of climate science experts. Um, and those big five beliefs are it's real, climate change is real, um, that it is uh, human caused, it's not just part of a grand cycle of things, um, that it's bad for people people. It's not just a problem for plants, penguins, and polar bears, but it's bad for people as well. Um, that climate scientists agree on all of these points, um, that the disagreement that you've heard about among the, in the climate science community is simply not true. The vast majority of climate scientists have long since been convinced by the evidence that climate change is real, human caused, and, and serious. And then finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, that climate change is, while it is a big problem, there's no doubt about that, it is also a solvable problem. There are things we can do to prepare for it, and, um, and there are things we can do to limit it. Um, and, and it's that solvability that even among Americans who care most passionately about climate change, who are most worried about it, many of them, most of them, in fact, have a real dearth of belief in the solvability of the problem. And when people don't believe problems are solvable, they, turn to, they tend to turn their attentions elsewhere. So those are, those are my communication tips. I, I hope you will consider them carefully. Well, thank you very much, and definitely part of our goal with the Communicating Change series is to get to those clear, compelling messages that can be repeated often. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Ed Maybeck, Director of George Mason University Center on Climate Change Communication. We appreciate it greatly. And on behalf of Climate Access and our partners, Climate Nexus, we appreciate all of you tuning in 
to communicating change, please visit climateaccess.org for more great tips like the ones Ed shared today and more discussions on how to have the climate impacts conversation and other aspects of engaging the public in addressing the challenge. My name is Kara Pike and I'll see you next time on Communicating Change. Thanks so much.